much. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the program, State of the Nation, right here on Hot 102 FM with your truly Conrad O'Brien. As we promised you that we were trying to um, get a brief discussion with former Prime Minister, the Honorable Bruce Golden, and we gather that we have former Prime Minister Golden online as we say, good morning, Mr. Golden. How are you doing, sir? Uh, good morning. How are you? Not bad at all. Very well. And you? I'm good. I'm good. I give thanks. Great. Um, now, Mr. Golden, we um, in recent um, days, you know, a lot of discussion have been taking place about the development of the North-South Highway, and um, you have weighed in on it to put some perspective to the whole, um, the, the whole scenario. Could you share with our listeners your take on it? Some persons are saying that it's indeed a, it was a bad deal. You have weighed in, and you said you think it's value for money. Money. Could you share with us your views, please? Well, let, let's spend a few minutes looking at the history. Uh -huh. of, of the project. Uh, from I was a little boy, yes, uh, 50, oh, more than 50 years ago, we have been talking about the need for a highway to link the south coast with the north coast because uh, we have a situation where you have economic growth centers on the south coast, Kingston, Spanish Town, Maitland, Mandible, um, going all the way down to Saint Lamar. Um, uh -huh. And you have growth centers on the north coast, yes. Ocho Rios, now Falmouth, Montego Bay. But we don't, we didn't have a connecting link. And you, you know, as everybody knows, uh -huh. the tortuous route that we used to have to take. Indeed. Going up Mount Diablo. And if, 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 if a trailer ever broke down, we could be locked up in traffic for hours. Or have to sleep so, there. <laughs> so it's something that has been talked about for a long time. But what was always the bugbear, what was prohibitive was the cost. Mm -hmm. Because the terrain was, from an engineering point of view, very challenging and very expensive. Yes. So we have kept talking about it. Now, under the Highway 2000 program, which was the brainchild of T.J. Patterson, uh -huh. the French company, Bowie, built, as we know, the East-West Corridor. Uh -huh. They were then contracted to build the leg from Linstead to Manig, essentially to avoid having to go up Devil's Race Course. Uh-huh. And to avoid that kind of traffic snarl. Yes. But they ran into problems because I think there was hasty and faulty engineering. Mm -hmm. um, to be political for a moment, uh, there was a rush to get it in place before uh, the 2007 elections. And I think that in that rush and that haste, some faulty engineering design work was done. Mm -hmm. So they got to a stage where the project virtually collapsed. Yes. And Bowie, Bowie said that they, they couldn't go any further with it. And it was sitting there as a white elephant. Mm -hmm. Now, during the time that I was in office, and I give credit to Mike Henry for this, yes. he had discussions with the Chinese, and he said to them, can you take over this failed leg between correct the engineering problems, get that completed, and then can you as well do the Cayman of the Linted Leg yes. and the Man and the Manig to Ocho Rios Leg mm -hmm. so that we would have something that we have been dreaming of for the last 50 years, mm -hmm. the, the link between the North and South Coast. Now, when they crunched the numbers, what was very clear from the very outset is that based on the traffic count and, and based on the cost of construction, there was no way that the toll collection could ever um, justify that expenditure. Yes. It, it was not a good economic deal. Uh -huh. But in the discussions with them, they expressed interest in doing other kinds of investment um, in Jamaica. Yes. And what, they, what, we, what we discussed with them was, if we provided lands to them along the corridor, they were prepared to invest in building hotels, commercial centers, and large-scale housing projects mm -hmm. as a means of recovering the investment that they would have to make in doing the road. Good. Now, the road cost 720 million U.S. dollars uh -huh. to build. And we calculated at that time, although we didn't have the, 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 the final 
value estimate, but we calculated at that time the transfer of 1,200 acres of land to the Chinese yes. on which they would do these various developments. Now, people are criticizing the dealer, so you know you're giving away land to Chinese. But Conrad, I like to make things simple. Yes. <laughs> and I, I say to people, grab an envelope. On the back of your envelope, let us do the arithmetic. Indeed. Now, based on what Mr. Ivan Anderson told Parliament last week, in order to build a highway, government had to spend 33 million U.S. dollars to buy lands that were privately owned on which the highway was built. So let's write down 33 million. Mm -hmm. The lands that were, <coughs> were transferred to the Chinese in the Miami Bay area, that is at the northern end of the highway, Yes. according to Dr. Phillips, those lands were valued by two professional valuers mm -hmm. at, a, at, at a value of 44 million U.S. Mm -hmm. So write down 44. Mm -hmm. We are supposed to transfer 600 acres of land in the Caymanas area, that's at the southern end, to them. And we, that has not yet been valued. It must be valued. One of the things that I would insist on is that every acre of land that is to be transferred must be valued because we must know what it is that we are giving up. Mm -hmm. Now, I have used as a proxy for that value yes. the valuation that was is included in the Caymanas Economic Zone Development Plan. And that plan is fairly recent. It was done in 2013. Mm -hmm. So the valuations would still be fairly current. You yes. can make adjustments for the four years that have passed since. The inflation era there. Mm -hmm. And based on the valuation that they used in the Caymanas Economic Zone Development Plan, I have put a figure of 36 million US dollars on the Caymanas lands. Mm -hmm. Now there's another parcel of land that is to be transferred, and that is in the Golden Grove area. I don't have any reference figure for that, but I am making an assumption that Golden Grove lands would not be as expensive as Miami Bay, would not be as expensive as, as Caymanas. So I'm putting a, 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 an assumption of a half of the value of the Caymanas land, that's the cost per acre. Yes. And when I work that out, that comes up with about 10.5 million US mm, dollars. 10.5, mm-hmm. When you add those up, you come up with 123.5 million US dollars. 120, yeah, 123.5, mm-hmm. That would represent the investment of the government of Jamaica into the project. <laughs> yes. Now look, what we have ended up with is a magnificent highway that costs Seven hundred. Well, seven hundred and twenty. But when you're minus, say six hundred and. No, I'm not minusing. I'm gonna add. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seven hundred and twenty million they spent to to build it. Yes. And we are putting in a hundred and twenty million. That is eight hundred and forty million. Mm -hmm. So we have an eight hundred and forty million dollar project. Now, what I say to the to, to the critics, if if the Chinese were not involved, Conrad. If the government had taken the same lands, sold the lands for $120 million, yes. and then gone to the World Bank and borrowed the $720 million to build the highway, mm -hmm. I don't think you'd hear one word of criticism. Yeah, yeah. But so, what that would have done is that it would have put another $720 million US dollars on the, on, the, on the national debt mm -hmm. that we would have to spend the next 20, 25 years servicing and, and repaying. Absolutely. Plus, in addition to that, we would have the burden of maintaining the highway during those 20 years. C certainly. So, from hold on, hold on. Let me just complete the point. In this, and, and maintaining a highway like that is expensive. If you look at the east-west corridor and look how frequently there are resurfacing sections of that highway, even though you and I may not be able to see what is wrong with it while they're resurfacing it. Yes. But, but that's the kind of, that's the quality of maintenance you need for that kind of highway. So we now have an important economic investment. We have had to put up 120 million. Uh -huh. The Chinese have put up 720. The investment that the Chinese is supposed to make in the corridor is virtually guaranteed. And why do I say it's guaranteed? If they don't build those hotels and those commercial centers and those housing projects, they can't make back their money. They can't get back the 720 million, all that they're making from the highway now, you know, after they, after they take out 
the cost of operating the highway is three million US dollars a year. Uh, but it is costing them 30 million US dollars a year to but, service the 720 million dollars of investment they have made. So the, so the investment is virtually guaranteed. Uh -huh. one, one last thing I would say. Go ahead, sir. When Bustamante built the Sandy Gully in the 1940s, uh -huh. he was heavily criticized. They call him a, government, a gully government. But he had a vision because without that Sandy Gully, the corporate area couldn't be what it is today. Because there was no route, no waterway uh -huh. for the surface water to get to the sea. When Norman Mandy built that highway through Negril in the 1950s, uh -huh. he was ridiculed. <laughs> he was criticized. But if we hadn't, if he had not built that highway through Negril, Negril would still be a home for mosquitoes and the, the seven miles of white sand beach we have there would be sitting down smiling at the sun every day and we would not have seen the kind of development that has taken place in Negril. Uh, Norman Manley again. Uh -huh. I don't think you you're too young to remember. <laughs> Go ahead, but, the but, history but, is there, Mr. Golden. But, but, we can but, read it. But but in the in the late fifties, uh -huh. when Norman Manley announced that he was going to build a national stadium, he came under a lot of criticism, you know, including from the Jamaica Labour Party. Uh -huh. Heavy criticism. You're wasting money. Now somebody must go sit down with Usain Bolt. Or Shelley and Fraser. Yes. And try and explain that reasoning to them because without that national stadium, we could not have achieved the success that we have achieved in athletics. So, some of these things that we do, initially, they may, you know, you, somebody may say, but you, you're spending a lot of money. We have to look long term. Yes. And what we now have is something that we have dreamed about for 50 years. We now have it. The development that we that it is going to stimulate won't come in a year, two years. That's long term. Absolutely. But it is going to facilitate significant economic development in Jamaica, which Jamaica needs badly. Uh, and you know, Mr. Golden, um, just just to be um, a little more current, we all remember some of us in more uh, that are younger. We will remember that when the Highway 2000 uh, idea came to front. Um, former P.J. Patterson was criticized as well. And can you imagine if we were, well, it was questioned as to whether we should develop the interior roads rather than going highway. So we always have this kind of narrow-sighted vision without yeah, looking long-term. Yeah. But in relation, uh -huh. in, in relation to, to the Highway 2000, and I believe that even P.J. himself would, would acknowledge just in hindsight, uh -huh. the financing arrangements were burdensome mm -hmm. because we have we now have an accumulated debt of four hundred and thirty six I think it is million u s dollars and it grows every year because we're not earning any money from it, and we have to be servicing the money that we borrow to put into it, so it goes up every year so the financing arrangement for that is something that I think in hindsight we should probably have tried to cut a better deal, but mm -hmm. the value of that project to Jamaica's development, even though we haven't even begun to realize it yet. But the value of that project to Jamaica is developed. You, 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 can't, you can't have a successful economy without efficient infrastructure. It uh, doesn't work. Absolutely. Let me ask you something here, Mr. Golden. In terms of development generally across the globe, the, the, the world being a global village today and everybody basically scrumming or, um, or climbing over each other in terms of ad uh, attracting investment. Um, how these things operate? Do we have to basically offer from time to time, you know, special offering to well, attract, remember, attract remember, investment remember, overall, not just the highway, but in general? What obtains there? Well, remember, you know, that uh -huh. we're not the only one looking for investment. Um, you, you, you talk about the globalized village. Mm -hmm. Because of that globalized village, the menu of options open to international investors is now very wide. There was a long time ago during the Cold War where there was a narrow list of countries where investors would put their money. They weren't going into communist countries. Um, that, that, so they were looking for those countries that were, for want of a better expression, with the West. Yes. And they were looking at investments in an era of high level of protectionism mm -hmm. so that they could look at those countries that offer the best possible deal. With globalization, with the World Trade Organization um, platform for trading rules, 
they now can look. I mean, American investors are going into Vietnam <laughs> and pumping serious investments into Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that there is a long line out there of countries that are looking investment. And therefore, we have to find a way. How do we sweeten the pot? Absolutely. To get, to, to get investors to come to Jamaica rather than going to Asia or going to Africa. Africa is not attracting a lot of investment. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very competitive world. And in relation to the Chinese, there's a certain amount of resentment to the Chinese and people ask, you know, what is their agenda? Well, they do have an agenda. The Chinese are strategically seeking to expand their investment interest in Latin America and the Caribbean. They have now become global because the Chinese economic development has reached a stage where their middle class is growing so fast that they now feel that their economy can take care of the people in China. They want now to expand themselves across the globe. There's nothing wrong with that provided uh -huh. there is no incongruity between their agenda and our development agenda. Uh, ups, ups. When Hugo Chavez, for uh -huh. example, came with Petro Carib, he wasn't doing that on layout of altruism. It's not because he's just a kind fellow. Yes. He wanted to expand his influence in the region. Indeed. And we saw it as an opportunity where we could benefit. And we didn't see any harm in Venezuela expanding its influence in the region. Mm -hmm. So that when you're looking at international investment, where you, you, you have to calibrate yourself in such a way that you benefit, the investor is going to benefit to an, uh, uh, unless or, or else he's not coming. But you want to make sure that the investor doesn't benefit at your expense. So you have to get some benefit too. Now, when the Chinese build these hotels yes. along the corridor, they can't keep those hotels locked up, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and we are under no obligation to find guests to put in those hotels. So they have to go find the guests they have to go bring them here, and I'm willing to bet you, you're going to see them not only operating the hotels, they're going to establish it, or, or, or perhaps have it already, their own travel companies, their own, with their own planes that yeah. will bring the, 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 the visitors here. When they build those commercial centers, they're going to have to put them to work. Why? Because if they don't do that, they can't make back their money. Now, in that kind of situation, they win, but we win as well, because look at the jobs that are going to be created in terms of the jobs. Mm -hmm. We always have this problem of how many Chinese are going to bring with them. And that now is something that I hope Has the government is going to sit mm -hmm. down with them and say, well, look, we know you have to bring some people, but understand that we have to agree on what portion of the labor force is to come with you and what portion must be provided by Jamaicans who need employment. So I those are things that we're going to have to sit down and work out with them, but is a win-win situation for us. And do, do, those those are housekeeping matters that can be tied up between no, states. No, I would put Me them as more important than housekeeping mm -hmm. because the last thing you want now is to see a hotel that employs 400 people and is 385 Chinese over there working. You don't want to see that. So that's an important thing that we're going to have to sit down with them and do. Mm -hmm. But then we, we, we hold the handle on that because they can't work here without uh, a work permit. Permit. Mm -hmm. Hello? But, but, you know, in addition to that, as we're talking about, we also have to look at our own, our own culture. Yes. And I'll give, I give you a true story. Uh-huh. When the secret hotel was being built. Yes, sir. I actually broke down. Mr. Goli, I don't know Little what happened. You're coming in and out um, just suddenly. Um, go, go, go on, go on, sir. I can go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. I'm hearing you better now. Much better now. Mm -hmm. I went down and said to visit the site. And there was a whole group of Jamaicans outside the gate who wanted to talk with me. And they were agitated. And when I spoke with them, they said, you know, too much Chinese man over there working for. Mm -hmm. So I, I picked up the phone and I called Fernand Charles. Yes. And I said, Fernand, when we were working out the arrangement for secret hotels, we had discussed that we were going to limit the number of Chinese who could come there and work. Uh -huh. um, so how is it now that there's so much Chinese on the side? He said, let me sit and get back to you. When he called me back, well, he called me back and said he was sending an officer down there. I got the report about two days later. You know what the story was? Go ahead, let us know. They brought in a Chinese master carpenter. The 
master starting to climb the ladder, does his former and so on. While he's doing that, the hammer that he has in his belt may drop on the ground. He comes down off the ladder, picks up this hammer, <laughs> he goes, hold on, he goes back up on the ladder and he does his work. When he's finished putting up the former up here, he comes down, he grabs the wheelbarrow, he grabs the shovel, and he cleans up the place and then grab a broom and then sweep it up to make sure and keep the place clean. Now the workers saw this man out there pushing wheelbarrow and sweeping up the ground. I said, well, you know, you have Chinese man come here and push wheelbarrow. Oh my goodness. Right? Now, a Jamaican master carpenter, he's not going up on that ladder unless he's giving him a second, you know, they call him a second. Mm -hmm. Who stands at the bottom of the ladder so that when the hammer drop out of him belt, him pass up the hammer to him. And don't ask a Jamaican master carpenter to go take a wheelbarrow and pick up the rubbish and sweep up the place. That is, that is, that is not his job. We have to begin to learn that, you know, globalization is not just in terms of the goods that are now coming in here from Asia and everywhere, but it's in terms of labor and labor practices. And we are going to have to perhaps look at what the Chinese is doing. Remember the lady, Mr. Perkins, used to talk about it, <laughs> who told Mrs. Gluten that one Chinese man can do five months work. <laughs> five we go and have a look at that and see if we can adopt some of that. But, what, but, well. what, but what you just said, Mr. Golden, is a, the exact, the perfect example of one Chinese doing five months work. <laughs> well, that is it. Yeah. You know, but it's, I, remember, I remember when they were building the Chinese embassy uh -huh. on, on Retreat Avenue. I would be driving past there, coming home from a function at 10 o'clock at night. And I see people over there working with them hard hat. They work around the clock. Now, we perhaps don't have to enslave ourselves to that extent, but it is, it is, a, it is a tragedy and an indictment when you look at the statistics coming out of the Labor Productivity Center mm -hmm. that says that labor productivity in Jamaica has declined for the last 40 years, every year except one year. My goodness, sir. Really, for the last 40 years. Re really an indictment there. Mr. Goli, in terms of getting that productivity up, you know, you're always a thinking person, a former prime minister, somebody who have your finger on the pulse. What do you think the powers that be need to do at the beginning for us to start see us going up on that trajectory? Well, it, it involves a number of elements. It involves training, because I'm not sure that we're training our people for the, for the kind of workforce, labor market that we have today. Um, I, I, I don't believe, for example, that, uh, and, and it may be a harsh criticism because I'm not close enough to it to know all of that, mm -hmm. but I don't believe that the Ministry of Education, for example, is sitting down with the Ministry of Labor enough to say to them, now, Give us an idea as to what, what will be the labor market demanding in 10 years' time. Yes. Give us an idea so that we don't go and train the little children them in things that where they come out, they can't find a work. Mm -hmm. We want to train them for the kind of jobs that 10 years' time the market is going to be demanding. Um, that kind of thing. Then in addition to that, I think the employers themselves have to do more on-the-job training. Employers can't expect that every worker they employ must be somebody who is an expert. They must incorporate training as part of their human resource yes. development practices. In addition to that, we need an attitudinal change, a culture change. I'll, I'll give you another example. Go ahead, sir. There's a construction taking place right next door where I live. A new house is being built. Mm -hmm. um, and I can sit in my study where I am now and I'm actually looking at the site. I remember one day and they're very loud over there. I did one day I had to go complain to the supervisor and beg them to kind of tone it down. Yes. But one day, one worker was giving a joke about something that happened at some dance that he went to the Saturday night. And would you believe that everybody stopped working? And I saw them, you know, even the man on the ladder. Yes. Him stop what he was doing now to turn around and to contribute something to the joke. I remember Douglas was telling me years ago when he was Minister of Industry mm -hmm. that when he visits a factory in Jamaica, when he enters the factory, everybody looking up at him, some of them want to shake him hand and so on. I imagine nowadays that you have cell cameras, they don't want to take selfies. Too. Yes. He said when he went to Korea, 
and they took him on a tour of the factory of a factory over there. He walked into the factory and he spent about twenty minutes in the factory. Not one worker raised their head and look up. Everybody busy with them work going on the same way. Mm -hmm. Because their job is to do the work. Their job is not to go stare at no visitor that coming into the factory. Yes. But in a Jamaican factory work stop for half hour until the minister leaves. Um, it's, uh, it's a culture change that we need. Mm -hmm. We definitely need that culture change, Mr. Golan. It can't come too fast. Now, Mr. Golan, one of the other... Just, run, leave just, just, <laughs> just, before you, just before you run, one quick other question. The question that asks more very frequently as it relates to Chinese invested, investment, Mr. Golan. Persons uh, are saying, could we see where we as Jamaican being shut out by virtue of the Chinese investment because they will be having this as kind of their own haven, sort of an island? Not at all. Uh -huh. Not at all. Not Address at that for us. The land, for example, the lands that we are giving to the Chinese, mm -hmm. um, those lands been sitting there now from you and I were picnic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, 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 I doubt if any local investor ever come forward and say, hey, you know that, and 200 acres you have there, I have a little plan there that I could do a development on 50 of those 200. Uh, that opportunity must always be open. And perhaps one of the things that the government need to do is to put out advertisers and say, here are opportunities, whether it is land, whatever it is. Here are opportunities. Come to us now and give us some ideas as to what you plan to do. Let us consider that. But, but, but that must not preclude. If China Harbor were to call the minister or call the prime minister and say, look, we need to, we'd like to have a meeting with you. Uh, we have an idea here. We see you have this piece of land on the south coast, uh, we had a look at it and uh, we want to put together a proposal how to how to develop it and we are prepared to bring in all the financing. You can't tell, well, no, we can't do that because we have to wait and see if any Jamaican interested in it. Absolutely, absolutely. We're not, we're not short of investment opportunities. What we want is people who are bold enough and risk, uh, uh, prepared to take mm. the risk and say, no, I'm going to do an investment and come to government and come with a proposal. Now, when you come to government with a proposal, the government don't pay you no mind. But next thing you hear, you know, that we go on to China to go look somebody for that. That would be a basis for a legitimate complaint. Yeah, indeed. But that, that is not as far as I know. That is not what is happening. But I really think the government perhaps ought to provide more information as to what investment opportunities are out there so that everybody, me, you, everybody, can look at it and say, hey, you're up. Let me try a thing here yes. and put together a business plan and come to government and say, hey, you know, look at this plan and we're going to see if we can do a deal on that thing. Because if, if Prime Minister Holness is to achieve his prosperity agenda, you need the investment. You ain't going to get it no other way. Do, do, you, do you think, Mr. Golden, that this is a part of, should be a part of the mandate of, say, for example, the Growth Council, what you just of, spoke of? Of, it, it, of, of course. It, in terms of putting those modalities in place, mm -hmm. absolutely, yes. Conrad, I really have Thank to you very much, Mr. Mr. Golan. Thanks a million. We're most grateful. All the best, sir. Good, good. good. No, Take no, care. No, Great. So that's former Prime Minister, the Honorable Bruce Golden, and we're very, very delighted.